All right, everyone, let's uh, get started here. Um, so I first want to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Eitan Marks. I'm a consultant with Castle Biosciences. And we have today the very wonderful, prestigious Dr. Alexander Witkowski, who is a medical dermatologist with expertise in early non-invasive detection of skin cancers, particularly melanoma. Uh, he completed his medical training and residency in Europe, as well as his PhD in Modena, Italy, uh, focused on implementing virtual biopsies with dermoscopy and reflectance confocal microscopy at the bedside. Very cool stuff. Uh, he is currently an assistant professor and co-director of the Skin Cancer Imaging Center at Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland, Oregon. Uh, before Dr. Wis Witkowski gets into uh, his cases that he's going to present, I just wanted to give a little background about my path just to make sure everyone understands uh, the technology uh, first, and then we're going to let Dr. Witkowski go ahead. Um, before we begin, please mute your microphones or whatever might cause any noise. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand or submit a QA in the chat. Uh, and we, if you have questions, we want you to be able to ask and uh, participate in any way possible. Uh, this will be recorded and archived uh, and will probably be available on YouTube uh, and probably on the Castle website. Next slide. So here's uh, Dr. Witkowski and myself, our, uh, our disclosures uh, and next slide. Okay, so Castle Biosciences has three main uh, dermatology related products, Decision DX Melanoma, Decision DX SCC, and MyPath Melanoma. The first two are prognostic, one for cutaneous melanoma, one for SCC, and the MyPath Melanoma, which is a diagnostic test, which helps differentiate ambiguous melanocytic lesions. And that's what we're gonna be discussing today. Next slide. So just some background. Um, my path uses RNA, so there's DNA, which every, most people will be familiar with, FISH, ARACGH, uh, NGS method, which detect genes that are present or absent or mutated. Uh, RNA is gene expression, which is basically uh, the cell takes the DNA and now has incorporated uh, methylation and other information into the messenger RNA, which then will go and make protein. Uh, and the protein is what actually expresses on the cell and so on. But the RNA is very important because it takes into account a lot of extra DNA uh, factors like methylation, which is very important for churning genes on and off, which is why my path was developed with the gene expression profile, which is RNA based. Next slide. So here, the gene expression pattern, which was done with MyPath, was basically shows a certain number of genes. It was 23 genes, nine housekeeping genes to make sure that the assay works, and then 14 other genes related to immune function and cell aggressiveness uh, and so on, and tumor microenvironment. And what, what MyPath did was they developed an algorithm based on known melanomas and known nevi to decide what the gene expression profile would most correlate with. Is it more similar to nevi or to melanomas? Next slide. <clears throat> so what happened is they had discovery where they had candidate genes, and then they had training on these genes that they found could differentiate, and then the validation, uh, which showed that it actually works to diagnose melanomas versus benign nevi. Next slide. So just to summarize, 23 gene expression supported by guidelines. There's 10, now there's more than 10 peer reviewed publications for it. And the, the massive study, the largest studies that were done showed between a 90 97% sensitivity and an 89 to 96% specificity. So, much, much more useful uh, for helping differentiate a melanoma from a benign nevus than just uh, information of what genes are and aren't present 
uh, and especially more more helpful than IHCs, which don't really give the aggressiveness of the tumor cells. They just highlight whether something is or is not of melanocytic origin. Um, and then what the algorithm spits out is a suggestive of malignant or suggestive of benign, and about 10% of cases will be intermediate, indeterminate, intermediate, where they're not, it's not really giving you a specific answer because it's in a gray zone of could be benign, could be malignant. Next slide. All right. And now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Witkowski. All right. Thank you, Aton, for the introduction to, uh, to me and also to 23GEP, commercially known as MyPath. So before I start with the first case, I want to just really set the tone for the audience what the intention of this test is in the hands of two different types of settings. And the first setting is the one that a physician, pathologist, or dermatopathologist like Dr. Marks will use this test when they have a level of uncertainty looking under the microscope initially with an H&E stain or some other additional IHC stains to help the pathologist get to a more clear, final, clear-cut diagnosis. And in, in a setting like myself and in our, in our audience, for anybody that's a clinician, uh, dermatologist or a dermatology provider, I'm sure everybody in the audience, although I can't see you, if I ask the question, have you ever felt looking with your naked eye, ABCD criteria, remember uniquely this year is the 40-year anniversary of that, it's also the 20th year anniversary of the three-point checklist criteria. So if you're using your dermatoscope and you see features such as 50% blue color or round structures and pseudopods, and your clinical experience and inclination is that this melanocytic lesion is having a high likelihood to be a melanoma, but then you get the report and it just doesn't match what you've seen. And so this is a setting where tests like this can help provide ancillary information and better guide your clinical management because ultimately the diagnosis is really for one reason or two reasons. Tell you what it is and based on what it is, then you choose the correct management of the lesion. So with that preface, I present the first of seven cases today. And this is a 45-year-old female who presented to my office with a three millimeter flat atypical lesion on her right cheek. The background about this patient, she already had an invasive melanoma on the left arm that was very cosmetically disfiguring, and she had other biopsies performed, and she had a biopsy phobia, and more importantly, she really had a true melanoma phobia, so she already had it. And so I identified this lesion, which I present to you now in dermoscopy, and I've made it easy by showing these really salient features. So you can see here when we're looking at the cheek in a typical pigment network perifollicular hyperpigmentation. And really that network is just irregular borders. Should say borders, I apologize. And with that, when I'm looking at this lesion, the first thing you should be thinking to yourself is, is this a melanocytic lesion or is this a non-melanocytic lesion? So could it be a melanoma or is it just absolutely something else? Um, a non-melanocytic benign type of lesion. So I can't tell you with certainty it's a seborrheic keratosis or solar lentigo. And for this reason, that is why I chose to remove the lesion with concern for MIS. So I'll hand it over for a moment to, to Dr. Marks. Yeah, so in the microscopic image here, we see a very busy low power image where there's clearly uh, a lot of cells here. Um, there's inflammatory cells, which are much smaller, and then there are the melanocytic cells, which are larger and forming nests at the DE junction and even in the uh, papillary dermis as well. Um, and at the dermal junction, you can see a lot of uh, these white spaces where at the DE junction, those are probably confluence of melanocytes. Next slide. So on higher power, you can see the irregular nests that are not nicely placed at the base of the reedy ridges. There's uh, irregular uh, morphology, and there you might not be able to tell here because there's so much artifact uh, in the keratinocytes, but there are pagetoid spreading melanocytes uh, and irregular nests. So to me, this is highly worrisome for an MIS arising in a background nevus because the dermal melanocytes look more nevoid and the dermoepidermal junction uh, melanocytes look more irregular, more atypical. 
So I would be highly worried that this is an MIS arising in a background nevus based on uh, histology, but I would want to get stains. And if I didn't see so much metroid spread or that many confluent melanocytes, it might make me more unsure of the diagnosis, but this is highly worrisome. So you can see here the result that I received, uh, and I want to be very clear, I did not receive this result from Dr. Marks. I received this from the pathology group at my institution. So you see here a melanocytic nevus compound type with atypical features, um, but there's no really specific, you know, specific description of what degree of severity or if there's any severity of all, any severity at all related to the atypia, whether it's low, intermediate, or high grade, or uh, uh, dysplastic, or high, severely dysplastic, or not. Um, and so, really, when I looked at this result, um, you know, with a high concern for this lesion being a melanoma, potentially a melanoma, and not having something that gives me information what degree of atypia is present. I was presented in a situation where we like to describe this as a lesion of uncertain malignant potential. And we have to remember that this is a young female. So all the decisions we make are prioritized, number one, by doing what's in the best interest of the patient's health. But the health of the patient is multifaceted. First of all, making sure that they live as long, healthy life as possible, but also mentally or psychologically to avoid unnecessary uh, removals um, on the face, especially these cosmetically sensitive areas, when in fact, if it's not a melanoma, then maybe we don't need to over-treat the lesion. So this is kind of that junction where, you know, I could monitor this lesion, do a deeper shape biopsy, uh, maybe do nothing based on this, or go ahead and then actually treat it like a melanoma. And so as you can see, with having more than three options, you know, only one of them is right, or only two of them are appropriate. And so with this level of uncertainty, I chose to order the test. So I ordered the 23 GEP test and the result came back positive or suggestive of malignancy. In that setting, still the lesion was reevaluated. It was not called a melanoma in situ by the pathology team, but I still recommended treatment after discussion with the patient as if it is a melanoma in situ. And this is really an important point to highlight in the first example is that the intent of this test from the company and also from my experience, it is not to ask your pathologist to change the diagnosis. It does happen rarely. That is not the intent as a clinician. It's to give an information. And in my case is to understand if I'm worried about melanoma based on the dermoscopic presentation of the lesion and I have uncertainty by the H&E initial pathology diagnosis and have a positive gene expression molecular test, well, I think that it's in the patient's best interest to play it safe, but play it safe based on factual objective data. And so I felt comfortable with the executive, I say the executive in the sense, the responsibility to engage the patient in discussion to perform a, a wider margin excision on the face, which can have its cosmetic outcome. But in this case, I felt comfortable objectively with this information. It's also important to note that some pathologists probably would have just called that an MIS arising in a background nevus. So the MyPath test really helps be the great equalizer here, you know, lets you treat it similar to how more in an objective way, I would say. Mm -hmm. And then this, thank you for mentioning that, Dr. Marks, because it's important to highlight that as the audience can hear, for Dr. Marks, this is a, a basically a clear-cut MIS, but for the team in, in Oregon, it wasn't. And we've presented the case elsewhere to understand it as you, if you're not already aware, so there are a plethora of peer-reviewed publications showing interoperator variability amongst dermatopathologists. So really, you send the same slides to 10 different people and not, you don't get 10 different answers, but you probably get three or four different uh, kind of gray zone areas. And that's important to consider because if you don't have that gray zone that leans towards the melanoma, then you may treat the lesion less invasively. And so the test like this can help provide guidance. Now, you don't just order the test blindly. The reason to order the test in my case was the clinical and dermoscopic su suspicion and of course, intuition and follow through. So not just taking the result at its initial 
face value. Right. And the ambiguity in the pathology report as well. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't too clear for me. So with case number two, this was a 32-year-old female patient of mine who presented with this eight by seven millimeter light dark dark brown macule on her left scapula. A biopsy was performed based on clinical suspicion and so ABCD criteria, and more importantly, dermoscopic features that are worrisome. So you can see here overall, and I'll give you the, the, the oops, the, 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 the next photo will be a confocal, sorry. Uh, uh, if you look here, you can see generally, if you look at the lesion, the first thing, the overwhelming uh, feature is asymmetry. And what I mean by that initially is the axial asymmetry. The left side of this pigmented network is completely different than the right. Like we can define a reticular network, a little bit of globules, some thickened network that's darker on the left side. You're not near the nine o'clock position on a, on a clock wheel. But on the right side, you have less pigmentation, absence of the round structures, and absence of a clear-cut reticular network. So that's the asymmetry in an axial observation. And then the thick and atypical network. And then you see right down at the bottom, these round structures, some of them are actually connected to the body of the melanocytic lesion to that reticular network or atypical network. And those could be earlier pseudopods. And if you look at literature, there was an article in 2010 out of the group from Graz, Austria. In cases of lesions that were melanomas and they had round structures, we know that they grow rapidly. So a good take-home feature or take-home point today is to really pay attention for round structures because they can be a great clue in your selection and choice to biopsy. So based on this, before I remove the lesion, you know, uniquely in Oregon in our imaging center, we have access to a reflectance confocal microscope. If you're not familiar with the tool, it's designed in America. It's used in the U.S. now. Initially, it was uh, the, the clinical application was very strong in Graz, Austria, and Modena, Italy, where I spent several years and focus on the tool. And what it does is give the clinician the optics virtually, painlessly, and immediately at the bedside. And so the reason I was worried that this lesion had a moderate to severe atypia was the presence of the cell you see in this black and white photo. That's one melanocyte with a very large dark nucleus and a bright cytoplasm squished to the periphery and different shape and size cells like that were scattered around. And so this is the reason in combination with the dermoscopy, I chose to remove the lesion. Now, I want to be very clear Without the confocal, I would have cut it anyways. And I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. Marks. So at low power, you can see a lesion that is mostly in the papillary dermis, but it's clearly a compound melanocytic lesion. Um, and let's go to the next slide so I can describe it. On higher power, you can see in the papillary dermis fibroplasia, uh, shouldering, which is where I have a nest that's three reedy ridges beyond the uh, dermal component of the melanocytes. And the atypia of the melanocytes is more moderate, where you have larger melanocytes, more pleomorphism, uh, they have irregular pigmentation and so on. So uh, to my eye, this is most likely a moderately dysplastic nevus. Um, I can't tell just on H N E if there's any pagetoid spreading melanocytes. I don't think there are, but I would in these situations I usually get a SOX10 just to see if I can find those. Uh, but based on the H N E, I probably would call this a moderately dysplastic because it has so many dysplastic features to it. Um, so that's pr probably what was being seen on the confocal microscopy. And so when I receive the result. Before we read the actual diagnosis, I want to highlight to the audience their, your attention. Please note that I really recommend that if you're using a dermatoscope to, to you know, select skin lesions for biopsy, if you can find the brief moment to include why you, you did it, right? So you see that we added the information that we had round structures, peripheral pseudopods, an uneven border, and we wanted to then, of course, ruling out melanoma, not just writing, please rule out melanoma with no context, right? So with that, then since I had seen all those, those uh, dermoscopic features, you see that this result doesn't match. There's a high discordance with what we saw in, in dermoscopy and then confocal if you have it. And we have a result that says melanocytic nevus compound type, right? And then you might ask yourself, well, is the pathologist not seeing so well in Oregon? 
The answer is no. It's not the pathologist's fault in this case. It's due to the inherent bias or sampling bias. If you think of a biopsied skin lesion as a hunt, as a loaf of bread, and you have a hundred slices of bread that represent the whole loaf, on average, about five to eight slices or five to eight percent are evaluated. So we don't know in this setting where those H and E slides were prepared initially for this diagnosis you see here. And that's why it's very important to follow up and look and you know remember if you were worried about melanoma, consider to document it um, uh, before you biopsy with a digital dermatoscope. So you can go back as a reference point. And that's exactly what I did. I said, that's not possible to say it's just a compound nevus because they've got plenty of them on my back and they're not getting cut out, right? And so because of that, I ordered the Castle test. And you can see here my path uh, 23 GEP test. So I ordered the test and uniquely, shockingly to me, I was very convinced I was, I wanted to make sure that it was, you know, severely dysplastic. It was for me, but it came back as negative or suggestive of benign. And so this is another way that the test can be used. Um, so if you have a negative result, the negative predicted value is very high. It's so high that in peer reviewed literature to date, there are no reported incidents of a recurrence of any of these lesions that have received a negative result or suggestive of benign green result, and then had a recurrence later. And so based on the data that I was aware of at the time, I made the decision and had a discussion with the patient. Um, you know, if we were going to do a large um, uh, removal with uh, excision of a narrow margin or five millimeters, it, you know, could have left uh, or would probably leave a very ugly scar on the scapula on a patient that's left-handed and plays tennis often. And so based on the use of this negative result, we decided to perform and engage something called digital dermoscopy monitoring. And so this is something I've done from day one on every single castle test or on all my patients in general, but on all of the patients that have had a negative result, I always, I always monitor it. I don't just tell them, oh, you're fine. It's negative. Don't worry. Goodbye. Like you are okay. But I think it's important to always do an objective follow through. And so we monitored this lesion. So basically we did not intervene further. There was no excision, no deeper shave. We just monitor the lesion at the six month window. And then, and then at the next time the patient visits. And so up till now, it's been three years and monitoring the lesion with digital dermoscopy, the scar site, the original scar site from the uh, initial biopsy does not have any repigmentation and hence there's no recurrence of the lesion. And so we could save the patient a potent, an unnecessary uh, removal with an excision that could have left the scar. So case number three, this is a 41 year old male who presented with a five millimeter macule on the left lateral forearm. This patient is very unique because he's had over 30 melanoma history and he's getting cut like Swiss cheese as, as diplomatic or not that that is. That's exactly what the patient tells me every time that he's seen me. And of course, he wants to make sure that there's no melanomas on his body. But unfortunately, he was getting cut with a ratio of about one to eight, one to 10. You know, so he has a lot, a lot of scars on his body that were not melanomas. And so we identified this lesion uh, he's on a very short mo monitoring regimen, sometimes six weeks, most often at least three months, no more, sorry, no more than three months interval. And, you know, clinically it stood out. And then in dermoscopy, the reason that we chose it is really because of this asymmetry and atypical kind of network, undefined, and then these round structures. And so I highlight that for you by making this in a little bit larger magnified view. And so you see these round structures are present on one side of the lesion at the three o'clock position, and they're not present on the right, I'm sorry, on the left side at the nine o'clock. And so this is the reason that I was concerned. A patient with a history of melanoma, especially so many, he's already over 40 years of age. This lesion is new because he doesn't, he was engaging and still does in total body mapping. And with round structures, new lesion, 40 years or older in that setting, always cut it out. And that's what we did. All right. So for this one, I took uh, two different pictures because there are two different morphologies of this lesion. This part of the lesion looks pretty uh, symmetrical. And you, you can see there's a nice um, dermal epidermal nest formation. Uh, 
not much fibroplasia, but a little bit. It's probably in the mildly dysplastic category here. Um, pretty typical melanocytes. Next slide. But in this other area, you had these nests at the DE junction that were larger, atypical, irregular pigmentation, uh, more fibroplasia, more inflammation, and it just had single melanocytes trailing off, as you can see in the higher power view there. So this is worrisome and uh, you know probably severe atypia here, um, and I'd probably get stains to help further categorize it, uh, but this is a highly worrisome lesion. So this is the result that I received. Again, please note that I added the dermoscopy features in the request and the referral. And so you see melanocytic nevus junctional type with atypical features. And then in the notes, you see that there is a mention of suspicion for melanoma in situ. So in this setting, anytime the word melanoma is mentioned, of course, you have to play it safe for the de defensive, defensive type of medicine that's practiced here in the U.S., but still, I believe in, you know, really being objective and doing precision medicine in the best interest of the patient. So since it's suspicious, it's not saying that it is a melanoma, but it's not saying that it's not. And this is, again, that definition of uncertainty. If you don't agree with that or it's difficult, if you don't understand where, where that context is coming from, the easiest description would be this pathology result. If you punch the word suspicious in the Webster's Dictionary, it's an adjective that is not definitive or descriptive enough to make a decision. And that's why the use of this test is valuable. And so you can see here that uniquely, when we ordered the 23 GEP test, it came back negative, right? And then remember, this is a patient with, you know, 30 plus melanomas, concern for malignancy. I wouldn't say very high, but it's there in dermoscopy because of the round structures. And then some difficulty with the, um, observation in regards to making a decision based on that pathology result. And when we received the benign result or negative with that high negative predicted value, I had a very long engaging discussion, not only with the patient, but with the patient's partner, his wife. And we agreed together to monitor and track the lesion. And you can see here that after 37 months, the lesion is stable without any repigmentation and no recurrence. Now he has had other melanomas since, but they're unrelated to the best of my knowledge, since they're elsewhere on the body anatomically, and this wasn't even called in situ, um, uh, unrelated to this. And so that's just to give a great highlight that, you know, even in this very difficult setting of a patient with such a high risk, you know, we're in an academic center, we are doing a little bit more science than let's say out in, out in the uh, private practice setting, but we are following objective, you know, pathways with our patients. And so I felt comfortable doing this we, of course, we're tracking it a bit more often in his unique setting than seeing it once a year. It was really at the third month and then Q6 months. And then we feel comfortable with the fact that it did not recur. The fourth case, this is a 48-year-old male who presented with this six-millimeter lesion on the left trapezius, a history of basal cell carcinoma, non-melanoma skin cancer, and also, in addition, fibro, the subtype of fibroepithelioma pinkus. His experience with that was very debilitating from a cosmetic point of view. I mean, really, really, really bad scar. This is a patient who has cancer phobia already. And, you know, any itch on the body thinks that there's something going on. And I absolutely sympathize with that. But the patient uh, was concerned about every single mole. Well, of course, I did a total body uh, evaluation with dermoscopy and I identified this lesion that I found to have some blue white veil in the center. I have enlarged it for the audience. An overall kind of reticular network, but it's a thickened atypical network. And in just going back, you know, really clinically, it stands out. That looks really, really bad, right? It's the ugly duckling. And in dermoscopy, it's concerning. Yeah. So at low power, we have your what looks to be a very pigmented area in the center of the lesion uh, with, you can see like a hue of fibroplasia around it. And if you can go on higher power, next slide. Lots of atypical melanocytes at the DE junction and pagetoid spreading along with the inflammation and the fibroplasia. To me, this is 
very suggestive of MIS. Um, some people might want to get stained. Some people might hedge a little, but to me, this is highly worrisome and probably most consistent with an MIS based on these images. But like Dr. Witkowski said before, we're getting recuts here. We don't know what the original pathologist saw. So I'm just pointing out here the congruence between what Dr. Witkowski is seeing and what we're seeing um, histopathologically. And so you can see here what type of pathology result I received. Now, remember where this is all in the context of, a, as you see in the clinical history, an asymmetrical lesion with blue-white structures. So a melanocytic nevus, compound type with another Webster's Dictionary word that's not definitive, which is the word unusual features. It's the gray zone type of description. And really no specific suspicion for melanoma in situ, at least. And then if you see the second to last sentence, it says clinical follow-up of the area would be reasonable. So you have to really think for a moment. I'm going to read that again, and I want you guys to think about this. What does that actually mean? Clinical follow-up of the area would be reasonable. So what kind of follow-up? Is that like, do I just say hi to the patient and just kind of glance at it now that it's the 40-year anniversary of ABCDE? Um, or should I be taking photos of this and monitoring it with a clinical image? Should I be taking dermoscopy images of the scar? Should I clinically follow up and do a deep shave biopsy if I want to over-treat it you know, with the intention of doing safety margins for the patient? If I'm concerned, should I do a unusual uh, features um, driven narrow margin excision with stitches? You see, there's like four or five options, right? And only one of them is correct. Maybe the set, maybe one other, maybe kind of, you could maybe think about doing it without overdoing something for the patient, right? So I ordered the test to provide more clarity and understand the GEP profile of a lesion that I was already highly concerned about with a dermatoscope. And it came back positive. Let's go back for a second. All we're seeing in, in the initial, this was the initial result to be very clear, melanocytic nevus compound, unusual, no grading, no specific mention of the atypia, right? But positive GEP profile. And so because of that, Please remember the clinical perspective of the lesion, how ugly duckling that it was, and the fact that it had the blue-white structures in dermoscopy. And with the positive 23 GEP MyPath test, we decided to do, a, of course, discuss with the patient. And in light of the fact that he saw that the lesion had a positive GEP result, he said, please, please get it out of my body, right? I did give full disclosure that, you know, I'm not saying this is a melanoma in situ, but likely it is based on my clinical dermoscopic and my GEP profile evaluation of the particular lesion of interest, right? And so we did do a five millimeter margin on that case. Case number five, some of you may have seen this before, but I think it's a, it's a great case um, not to recommend that you start taking a dermatoscope and then add a 100X magnifier. Please don't do that. I actually ordered this because I had seen something in Confocal, which you'll understand in just a moment. And the highlight for the for the audience is really to show you the power of gene expression profiling, and that even from the smallest or really the tiniest sample, enough gene material can be extracted from the RNA to give an objective information. So you don't need to go and do this in microscopic lesions, but you could. The technology exists. And so I found this lesion. The patient actually was worried about a cherry hemangioma that, you know, clinically for a, a patient without training in dermatology would be worrisome. I said, it's nothing, don't worry. Of course, I said that after I used the digital dermatoscope or the dermatoscope and explained to the patient why, the red lacuna, et cetera. But then when I did a thorough neck up exam, because it, remember, don't just like when you do a spot check, and I know you might be busy or rushing, but at least look in that whole area. Right. And that's what I've always, I was trained by my mentor to do that. I treat every patient the same way. So I, I did the neck up exam, a thorough one. And I found this really teeny tiny tip of the pencil macule on the right cheek in dermoscopy. This is a perifollicular hyperpigmentation around one pore. And I can't tell you with 100% certainty that this is a benign lesion, such as a seborrheic keratosis or a solar lentigo, right? And so 
I was curious and remember curiosity might kill the cat, but it drives innovation in medicine. If you ask questions, you will get answers. Sometimes you don't get answers you like, but sometimes you get answers that help make a change in the pathway of a patient's management. And that starts by having a correct diagnosis. And so I used the confocal virtual microscope. And what did I see? A lot of bright, hyper reflective cells glued to or aggregating around this follicle, some of them with nuclei. So I could say with 100% certainty that there are presence of atypical melanocytes. To be honest, I, I shouldn't have told the patient right then and there on the spot. I said, hey, I think this is the smallest cancer ever. But I did tell with the caveat, I don't think that the pathology team is going to be able to see this. It's so small. So I, I did a three millimeter punch biopsy and I received, before we go there, I received the result that was not melanoma in situ, was uh, no mention of any type of atypia, and in fact was initially called a benign solar lentigo with no mention of even um, any kind of atypical melanocytic proliferation or AMP. So that'll hand it over to Dr. Marks. So on, on this, we can see at lower power, there are these melanocytes throughout the, the uh, dermoepidermal junction that look a little bit enlarged, a little bit atypical, but it's also a there's inflammation. There's a lot of solar, solar elastosis. So this could be, and this power, just a, a solar lentigo separate keratosis. Uh, next slide. But on higher power, you really see that it might be just a little slightly increased, but the melanocytes are pretty atypical, uh, angulated, and there's some, I would say there's a, some pagetoid spread here even. So Personally, I would get a uh, SOX-10 or even a PRAIM on this to kind of highlight these cells uh, to make sure that I'm not missing a subtle MIS. Uh, but it is subtle, but there, it definitely looks atypical with inflammation, and there is papillary fibroplasia, which is somewhat more worrisome than just your normal solar lentigo. And thank you for mentioning that you would do melanin or SOX-10 or PRAIM but that's not what happened in this scenario. And that's really the, the, the moral of this case or the take home point is that, you know, I expect to get the diagnosis to guide management, but I have at least till now, no, in, I had at that time, no influence on what kind of stains are ordered. I mean, that's something that the pathologist should be making that decision on their own. But in my setting, those things were not ordered for whatever reason, right? And so with that, no mention of atypia, I, I had a complete disagreement with the pathology team. So they did a second cut, deeper sections. They said that there was some mild changes, but again, nothing Webster's Dictionary specific. And then a third time, I was denied the opportunity. And I said, no, we don't feel comfortable putting any more cuts through this block. So I asked, I said, well, I asked kindly, communicated that I disagree, and I would like to order as the clinician, the 23 GEP test, not to make them change their diagnosis, but I just want to make sure it's treated correctly. And again, highlighting what is the intent of you as the audience to use the test, not to prove anybody wrong. It's not to ask someone to change the diagnosis. It could happen. It will hear if you've seen this case before. It's to correctly manage the patient. So when I ordered the 23 GEP, the result came back positive. Still doesn't mean that it's melanoma. I'm going to treat it as if it is. But notice in the addendum, which was the fourth attempt at diagnosing this lesion correctly, all of a sudden the melanin and SOX stain stains, which are pretty inexpensive in general, they were ordered, right? They were ordered only because I followed through with this case based on my clinical dermoscopic concern experience and my gut instinct that there was something going on, especially since I had the, the uh, privilege of seeing the cells at the bedside using a confocal microscope, and the fact that it had a positive 3 GEP. Now, as a scientist, control, experimental group, I got the patient to agree to do three additional punch scouting biopsies based on dermoscopy and confocal in the periphery of the lesion, which they all came back negative. 
And in that setting, since this was positive from the actual material of the lesion of targeted interest, they did those stains, they reevaluated it, and they called it a melanoma in situ. So this was melanoma from the first time. Problem is they didn't, the pathology technician and eventually the pathologist did not receive the slide representative of what was already seen in dermoscopy and again, uniquely in confocal. And so ultimately this was called a melanoma in situ. And of course we treated it as such. Now it's on the face, it was so small. We worked interdisciplinarily with our Mohs surgeon team. They did a very narrow margin to the point where they got it down to two stitches, which is pretty small for Mohs. Um, and then just again to high into so the patient's doing fine. There's no recurrence. We've been tracking the lesions. No, uh, um, you know, even with such a small removal, nothing's going on in that particular area. And we're saying that by actually objectively tracking with the digital dermatoscope. And then just to highlight that those stains that were mentioned by Dr. Marks were only ordered in this setting because that the test was ordered by the clinician, which is the 23 GEP MyPath. It was driven by my dermoscopic concern. And uniquely, we got the Guinness World Record. I don't think that's as important as, yeah, as a direct call and, and, and a signed letter from the President of the United States uh, regarding just using these innovative technologies to make a change in our patient outcomes and our patient more, I wouldn't say outcomes, but our patient management to do what we think is the most precise and best and cost-effective for patients. So the next case, number six, this is a 58-year-old female who had a history of melanoma and presented with this new lesion on her left popliteal, medial popliteal fossa, biopsy performed, looking at it in dermoscopy. I mean, considering her age, she's 58 years old, you know, always be worried about lesions presenting around the behind the knee or popliteal fossa that you can't be absolutely sure that they've been there forever because she doesn't remember. Um, in this case, and not having a very clear, definitive, benign dermoscopic presentation. So you see here peripheral reticular network, an undefined network or light atypia, maybe some bluish hue. I know you might have different screens, so it's hard to see, but that's my recollection of the lesion. Here's an enlarged image of the lesion. I did confocal and there was some mild, uh, I mean, a low uh, number of atypical cells in my uh, patient charting, I couldn't, we couldn't find the, uh, the image for the purpose of illustration, but I just wanted to give that information and I'll hand it over with H&E to Dr. Marks. Uh, low power, we can see a melanocytic lesion that's been fully biopsied. It's compound, it has dermal as well as epidermal components. Higher power, there is atypia at the epidermal component, the at the DE junction. The dermal component has features of maturation and appears to be benign. Next slide. At a high power, you can really see the, there's fibroplasia, there's some atypia, there's some, some atypical melanocytes that are even single in between the nests. Uh, and then there was one area I found these irregular nests throughout. So it this is probably a nevus that has some dysplastic features. Depending on the dermatopathologist, they might just call it a compound melanocytic nevus. Some might call it a dysplastic nevus. Some might call it a compound melanocytic nevus with some atypical features and so on. But there is some atypia, but it definitely isn't to the level of MIS in these sections. Um, but there, there are atypical features which might have someone recommend re-excision or close clinical follow-up on the derm path side. Thank you, uh, Dr. Marks. I have to be honest, you gave a couple options there. So I'm not, we're not, you know, like my, in my experiences and probably the audience, you know, you could get a variety of different outcomes in regards to the diagnostic top level, right? And in my case, it just said melanocytic nevus compound type, right? And, you know, it, it's possible but, you know, my concern based on age, history, and anatomic location, dermoscopic features, so are the test, and I was proven wrong, and I have to admit that. I really thought it was uh, high-grade atypia, to be honest, but nonetheless, it came back negative, and I followed the science and uh, made the decision, a discussion with the patient, that we're going to monitor the lesion with a digital dermatoscope, meaning the scar. We did that. 
and it's now 40 months since uh, with no recurrence, no repigmentation, no recurrence. And so we can be confident to say that it was the right decision thanks to the high negative predicted value, right? So as a, you know, as a clinician and a scientist, I'm not always right, right? And this test helped lean more towards the lower aggressiveness of intervention, even though my dermoscopic suspicion was quite high. The seventh case and final case for today is a 43-year-old male who presented with this macule, about 10 by 6 millimeters, on the upper right back. Uh, uniquely, this lesion was being monitored for several years, and it was it was stable, pretty stable when I had looked at the images. But it was a clinical outlier, and if you know, you can see clinically, you see that kind of inside of the pigment network or inside the macule, an island or specific area that's a little bit darker. And this is the dermoscopy, and enlarged. And you see a reticular pattern overall generally symmetrical in the sense axial if you put the crisscross through it you'd be left and right same as up and down for the most part but in the center you kind of see a little bit of thickening of the pigment network the rings of the around the reticular pattern and then you see a loss of the rings and there's a very very faint bluish white area again that's uh very high level dermoscopy, but nonetheless clinical and dermoscopic. I thought, you know, this could be a melanoma in situ. So on lower power, you can see this is a melanocytic lesion that's mostly in the epidermis that goes to the edges of the biopsy. I'm assuming this was only partially biopsied, probably just the heavily pigmented area. And there are many single melanocytes, pagetoid spread, irregular pigmentation, inflammation, highly worrisome. Uh, next slide, I think it's higher power. And you can just see lots of single melanocytes, pagetoid spread. There's a couple of nests. There is a dermal component, which appears to be benign as well. But I would say this is probably an MIS arising in a background nevus. Uh, and the inflammatory cells are reacting to the MIS. Again, this is just a recut that we saw. We don't know what was originally seen, but this is histologically one of the easiest MISs you can diagnose. So the result that I received was melanocytic nevus compound type with atypical features. Um, some specific mention about nuclear hyperchromasia and intraspinous involvement are atypical features suspicious for melanoma in situ arising in a nevus. So the mention of melanoma in situ is there. I want to give that, that, that credit, but it's suspicious. Again, it's not definitive. And this is in the dead, dead, dead center back of a patient, young male. When you do a five millimeter margin excision here, and, and if you meet a surgeon who might do a little bit more to play it safe, you know, you could have a really ugly scar in this particular case, right? And so I ordered the test just to be sure. And it was concordant with those findings that Dr. Marks was showing. And so this had a positive GEP result. And because of that, we treated it. And it wasn't called melanoma in situ. Again, to be clear, it said suspicious, right? So he's not diagnosed with melanoma or in situ. His life insurance is not changed based on the, the, the diagnosis. But the treatment is according and I would say appropriate for what I had seen clinically with my naked eye and with the dermatoscope and based on the molecular GEP23 profile, we chose to treat it as such, which is as a melanoma in situ and remove it in its entirety. So with that, I've ran through all the cases. I wanna thank everybody for attending. Um, I don't know if Carrie is still on, but let me take a look and see if there's any questions in the chat. I don't see any, but I may be not privy to another area that there may be questions. Haley, you're muted. I've been keeping an eye on the chat, Dr. Wiskowski. I don't have any questions, but if anybody does want to put any in the Q&A now, is definitely the time to do it. Um, I've been listening to all of the, the conversation back and forth, and I really enjoyed actually hearing both sides of the story from the clinician view and then also from the microscope view, Dr. Marks. Um, it's interesting to hear both sides of it as you kind of go through the cases. Um, that's been, I think, the best part of this discussion today. I like hearing, you know, like I said, both sides of the story and, and the patient perspective, too, and how you both have followed the science of it with the test. 
It's yeah. very interesting. Also, I, th I think it's important to point out the different perspectives from the dermatologist point of view and the derm path point of view. So Dr. Witkowski is all about management. Like I'm not changing the diagnosis. I know a lot of pathologists get upset when they feel like the dermatologist is encroaching on the diagnostic portion. But I think this test can be used like Dr. Witkowski is saying it's supposed to be used for dermatologists. How am I supposed to treat this patient? When you get a derm path, diagnosing something that's ambiguous or they say suspicious for this or that, how are you supposed to know exactly how to manage them? So the derm path is trying to be as precise as they can with the slide that they have. So they're not looking at the clinical, they're not looking at, at you know, the, the confocal microscopy, they're not looking at the dermoscopy, they're only looking at the slide. So they, if they feel that an MIS diagnosis isn't on their slide, they can't give that to you. But as the clinician, you have the ability to say, well, with their atypia, ambiguous features, worrisome for higher grade lesion, and all these other features, I want to get something that's going to help me appropriately manage one way or the other. So I think that's an important thing to realize that even if you're not a derm path, you can still get this test to help management, even though it's not going to change the diagnosis, because diagnosis is based on what's on the derm path slide versus what the management is supposed to be. So I just wanted to point that out and say it out loud. No, I, yeah. I appreciate that, Dr. Marks. And I actually just thought of it now, you know, for the audience, really, if you feel that there is a sampling bias, I mean, that's just, where, this is where it comes down to with clinician driven use for a dermatologist and for a dermatology provider. If you've done, you know, dermoscopy, especially dermoscopy, right? But if you believe that, you know, there's an area in dermoscopy that's representative of a high chance of it being severely atypical or a melanoma in situ, and the result, as we've presented in some of these cases here, it just doesn't match at all. So if you feel that there's a sample bias that has occurred, then this test is, this is kind of where this test fits in, right? This test doesn't only look at the slides that were used to make the diagnosis, because when you order this test, the company will find the tissue. It's not your worry. Please don't think that's some kind of cumbersome process. You can write a fax order uh, with your team or order it in Emma in certain settings. So it's pretty quick. It's like two minutes, actually one or less in my case. But nonetheless, one, you know, once the tissue is acquired, it's a block that they cut nine additional slides. So that's nine more slices, not of 100 to be clear, but nine more slices than there were before. And then that those cellular components or first, those slides are evaluated by an in-house derm path at the company. And then the tissue scratched off the slide. And out of that sludge, the mRNA is extracted. And then it's ran against the um, 14, you know, experimental genes or test genes. And then the nine control genes, right, for the 23 tests. Mm -hmm. And that's why this is giving more information. This is not a test based on those slides that gave us that top line initial h &E based or IHC based diagnosis. It's based on nine more slides. And that's why we're able to provide this increased level of diagnostic precision. All right. So we do have a couple of questions coming through the chat. The first question is someone would actually like to see the very first slide again. And I'm going to ask for a quick clarification. Are you wanting the first slide that was discussing the actual MyPath test? Or are you wanting the first slide from the introduction to the case study? And so um, is there a way, Dr. Marks, that you could just walk through this slide again really quickly? Do you want to unmute uh, that? Yes. Me? Let's see if we can unmute her. And let's get that going. And... Maria, I'm going to unmute you, and so you should be able to unmute and ask any questions that you have. No, that was it. I would, I would just like Dr. Marks to go again over the slide a little bit. Thank you. No, not a problem. Basically, there's three stages of ancillary testing. There, can you uh, mute her again? Yep. There's no background noise. Um, so there's basically there's DNA, which is fish, a RACGH, and NGS, which this is what they're testing to pick up genes uh, that are present. Uh, there's RNA, which is the gene expression profiles. And then there's protein, which is basically IHCs, immune histochemistry. So fish and a RACGH and NGS are very powerful tools for telling us what genes are there. Fish uh, for melanoma diagnosis, 
people have either a four probe panel or they have a six probe panel uh, to pick up melanomas. Uh, fish is very non-sensitive, but, but very specific. Uh, like it looks for CDKN2A and a couple other different genes uh, that are very useful in helping you make the decision of melanoma. But it, it, one of the problems is it only tells you the gene and then it also only tells you when it's there or not. Array CGH is a very useful tool. Uh, however, it needs a abundant amount of uh, tumor cells. So it's most biopsies are not able to be done or under Array CGH and only very specific labs do it, um, like only Mayo Clinic and maybe one other. Uh, and then NGS is very useful, but it gives you a lot of information uh, without any real guidance. So you can find all different types of genes that are present. But for example, BRAF, BRAF was present, but does that mean melanoma or not? Because it's also present in 80% of dysplastic nevi. So these are all things that can help you, uh, but they're very uh, nonspecific, I would say, or nonsensitive. Uh, in the sense that you don't know what that necessarily means if stuff is present or not. Um, a lot of people do know how to interpret those in specific situations. For example, like a Spitz nevus, uh, you can get an HRAS present or different types of uh, fusion kinases that are present like ROS1 or ALK. Um, the other problem with DNA is that you don't know if those genes are methylated or not. So you don't know if they're turned on or off. You don't know if they're active or not. So if a gene is present, but it's not active, if it's unmethylated or if it's methylated, turned off, then it might, it might be irrelevant. Uh, what RNA, what the gene expression profile lets you do is it lets you see genes that you know are turned on and are producing uh, messenger RNA. So therefore we know how the biology of the tumor is progressing. Uh, so what, what Castle uses with the MyPathBest is this messenger RNA, the gene expression profile, which tells us if these genes are turned on or off and if they're present or not. Uh, and then what Castle did further was they validated a panel with an algorithm to tell you whether the gene expression profile of a melanoma matches your ambiguous lesion or not. Uh, and then protein expression is what we use in general and in, at most labs with IHC, which is like SOX10 or PRAME nowadays. And th that's very useful for identifying melanocytes. But uh, as you can see with a lot of the new literature, even with PRAME, uh, PRAME or P16 are not, uh, not gr great with their sensitivity and specificity. P16 can frequently be negative when it's a benign lesion, be positive with a malignant lesion. PRAME, same thing, you can have patchy, uh, and really there's only meaning when it's diffusely positive. And as I've spoken to many different experts, even when you have diffuse expression, it could be a Spitz lesion, it could be a congenital nevus. So there's a lot of different issues with each of them, but the, the gene expression profile I've found is, since it's been validated, it's one of the easier ones to use. It has a faster turnaround time as well. Hassel usually has a five day turnaround time, whereas FISH, NGS, as a send out test is usually weeks um, to a full month. And then IHC is usually less helpful. Uh, it, it kind of just aids in morphology. Uh, so if there's amb ambiguity with your lesions, I think gene expression profile in many, if not most situations is probably the first ancillary test that I would use after IHC uh, because IHC I see as an adjunct to my H&E diagnosis. Uh, I hope that was a good explanation. And and I wanted to add the comment just because you know Prame is so commonly used, and I'm giving this from a, a an eye you know bird's eye view or fly on the wall as a clinician, right? Just because something is Prame positive, it doesn't mean it's melanoma, right? It's all about context of the H and E, the clinical image, the dermoscopic presentation, H and E, and Prame or any other stain, and, and that also includes in a, any of these ancillary tests of which my path is one of them, right? So again, to be very, very, very clear for the audience, we're not saying that a positive GEP, you'd have to call it melanoma because you don't call it melanoma always when it has positive CGH, you know, fish or, or, or prank, right? It's all about the context. This is a tool in our toolkit. 
it's good for the clinicians as we tried to describe today and also for the pathologist to get and to achieve that most precise diagnosis possible. Yeah, they're all ancillary tools that help morphology. Now, positive or negative, it's really up to that dermatopathologist and their experience and their understanding of whether what the final diagnosis should be for diagnosis. Management is really up to the dermatologist slash oncologist. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Witkowski, for your um, cases today. And thank you so much, Dr. Marks, for getting on. It was a really wonderful discussion and I really enjoyed hearing it. And thank you uh, for taking time to answer some questions as well. Yeah, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email to my academic email, and I'm happy to, to answer any follow-up questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Castle, for the opportunity, and thank you, Dr. Marks, for an engaging discussion. Always fun. Hope to see you in, in uh, Delray sometime in the future when it's not so humid. Thank right. you, everybody. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Have Bye. a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.